Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Insights of Kiev, which is a series of online interviews organized by Kiev International Economic Forum. In this time of global pandemic and quarantine, we decided that it is a just the right time to invite distinguished speakers of Kiev International Economic Forum and other bright personalities from the world of politics, business, and science to discuss the hottest and most relevant questions that today in everybody's mind and on every country's agenda. My name is Nicholas Timoshuk. I am CEO of Your Future, Ukrainian investment and holding company. We are proud to be one of the founding members of Kiev International Economic Forum, and I personally sit at the um, board of Kiev International Economic Forum. And it is my privilege and honor today to have a guest here that I am looking forward to interviewing, Professor Lauren Graham, professor with MIT and Harvard, which is one of the most renowned specialists and thinkers in the world about science and innovation. Professor, thank you for your time and for opportunity to have this interview with you. Thank you very much, and I send my good wishes to you and all of your listeners. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm sure it's going to be an exciting discussion. And just so that you know, we're dubbing this interview in Ukrainian so that we can capture the widest possible audience and you can share your thoughts, not only with those that are fluent in English. Very good. I've been in Kiev. It's a wonderful city. Fantastic, thank you. By the way, where are you now? Cambridge, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's, uh, whether it's that tough as in New York, but I hope that you're safe and healthy anyway. Professor, now, the question really stems from our like, small talk um, uh, before we hit hard on this interview. How come that with all the scientific progress that we as humanity have achieved over the last couple of centuries, especially over the last century, it seems to me that we are still finding a global virus pandemic the same way we did a century ago. How come? Is that some sort of lack of foresight, negligence, or is there some sort of an insurmountable scientific challenge that we're facing particularly in this question? Well, first of all, I do not agree that uh, we are fighting it uh, the same way we did uh, 100 years ago. Uh, since uh, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, we have made magnificent progress in molecular biology. A hundred years ago, the term molecular biology uh, did not even exist. So why is it that it seems to you that we haven't made progress? I think the reason is that we have not yet had time to bring to bear the enormous armamentarium that this new knowledge uh, brings us uh, the advantage of. It takes time for us to use this new knowledge in an effective way. But I believe that within a year or, or year and a half, we will have an effective vaccine. And I, I believe, I don't know, of course, but I believe that even before that, we will have some therapeutics that will help fight the disease. Uh, enormous amount of work is going on right now in both of these areas, therapeutics and vaccine, and we will see them. And nothing like that could have happened a hundred years ago. Okay, fair enough. But then it seems to me that, God forbid, if another crisis or another uh, pandemic, another virus hits, for which we still do not have a vaccine, we will be bound to take the same path. Global quarantine, look for another vaccine, and all over and over again. My question is, is there any way known to science today that can help us to fight new unknown viruses more effectively, or at least discover or contain them more effectively? rather. There are some things that we could do and that we should have done, 
but we will never have an instant vaccine for anything that comes up. We don't know what's going to come up. We don't know what kinds of new diseases, what kinds of new mutations come up. Most of us, I do, take a vaccine against influenza every year. But that vaccine is different each year because influenza appears in different forms. It takes a while for us to be able to meet uh, the new challenge in the correct way. You can't do this instantaneously, but you can do it. And that's what's different from 100 years ago. Understood, thank you. Now, sir, to you, what does this crisis mean in broader terms? Well, I think that one thing that it reveals in broad terms, one thing that is not often discussed is the great degree of inequality in our societies, not only in our countries, but in our, on our globe. I fear what will happen when cor the coronavirus spreads uh, widely in Africa or some other countries where people inevitably live together. They can't escape each other. They cannot stockpile food. They cannot get adequate medical care. They have many disadvantages. So I think that in broad terms, what this coronavirus reveals is the disastrous effects of inequality. Do you think that this situation will help us as the global community to start addressing this inequality in a more effective and uh, way and more actively? Will we fight the inequality gap better? I'm much more pessimistic about that than I am about whether or not we will learn to conquer this particular disease. The inequality in the world is not going to be overcome in a year or two. This disease hopefully will be. Of course, I hope that steps will be taken to reduce inequality. But inequality is a problem that is not going to go away. And do you think that will prompt governments to think more seriously and hands-on about the basic income notion that has been discussed already for many years? I hope so, but I also would like to notice that the idea of basic income is available only to rather wealthy societies. Only rather wealthy societies have enough money that they can think about a basic income. A very poor society, its government, they can't even think about that. Which countries will succeed more in fighting such pandemics in the future, in your opinion? I think the announced success of China is just one more piece in that story. Because if China really did stop it, through very authoritarian methods, other countries will say, hey, let's do it that way. Now, I actually do not trust the statistics coming out of China. My guess is that the effects there are much worse than we have been told. But even if they are more effects, if China has managed to basically control this, through the use of the kinds of authoritarian methods that would be impossible in a, in a country like Great Britain or France, or for that matter, the United States. What other instruments uh, that can effectively prevent this do democratic countries have, in your opinion? Democratic countries don't have enough advantages in this struggle unfortunately, but they do have several. And one is that in democratic countries, there's more trust of the government, usually, than there is in non-democratic ones. 
And therefore, the government in a democratic country has the advantage, it's weaker than I would like, but the advantage of hoping that when it asks its citizens to do something, that they will do that. And we've seen that, you know, Sweden conducted a real experiment here. Uh, they trusted their citizens and the citizens trusted their government to a very high degree, higher than perhaps anywhere else, but at least very high. And so they decided to go on the voluntary path. It doesn't look like it worked out so well, but it worked out rather well so far. Yes, indeed, indeed. But just my personal remark is that for, it, for this method to work, a country must have a very mature society, a society with a very high sense of that responsibility. Um, Absolutely. Which many countries, both developed and developing ones, are still striving for only. And, uh, that is correct. Yeah. I agree with you. Sir, now, you are very well known for your uh, performance, for your speech. Uh, I think it was in Russia, if I'm not mistaken, where you uh, uh, threw out that metaphor, which really uh, resonated with a lot of people that in order to uh, bring up innovation, you must have the roots, the causes, the primary, um, primary uh, ingredient for that innovation, and you compare it to the milk and cow. You cannot wait or expect to have milk until you have a cow. And, uh, and uh, it, is, um, you know, it is very relevant today for a lot of businesses because uh, we all see that this uh, coronavirus pandemic has already triggered global recession. IMF says this recession by its depth uh, may be the biggest uh, known to us so far after um, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, stock market has not reflected it yet, in my personal opinion, but you know, uh, we shall see. Now, if, to summarize all of that, what, in your opinion, should a businessman or entrepreneur focus on in innovation in science in this situation, in this crisis or after this crisis? Well, obviously, a great deal depends upon what kind of a business it is. I mean, what this crisis means for a business that's in uh, biomedicine or pharmacy or that kind of work where they could actually do something uh, that might fight the virus. It means much something, it's very different for them than it is for a company that is doing completely different things. Well, they should be alert. And being alert means that they should create, it doesn't have to be a large or very expensive body that's looking for these things in advance and thinking about what steps that business should take should something like this arrive. They shouldn't be taken by surprise. And many businesses this time were. Yeah. For biomedical companies, it's a whole different story. For them, they should be prepared. And again, it requires having uh, a few bodies that are looking all the time for what's coming down the road and beginning to take steps to meet it. Uh, in terms of industries, except healthcare and pharma, which industries do you think should come better off uh, from this uh, recession and this crisis? And which industries, in your opinion, uh, may suffer the most? I think that the businesses, at least in the United States, that will suffer the most are what we call brick and mortar businesses. People have learned, I have learned, that I can get a lar very large amount of the things that I used to go to a store to get by ordering it online and having it delivered either by the post office or mail service or by a, an individual. And I imagine that I will continue to some extent 
to do that in the future, even after this epidemic has passed, when it seems to be, to me, to be more convenient to, than going to a store. So I think brick and mortar stores will suffer. Delivery services, and particularly Amazon.com, which will provide you with almost anything if you order it, will prosper, and they are already prospering. Since uh, Kiev International Economic Forum is, UN, is an event that takes place in Kiev, Ukraine, and I'm Ukrainian, I cannot uh, refrain from uh, asking you a question about Ukraine. Where do you see Ukraine in, the, in this whole situation? What is your forecast in Ukraine? Do we have a chance of coming off better of this crisis? And uh, if so, what is it that we should or shouldn't do uh, in this situation? Well, the easy answer to your question is get rid of, or at least dramatically reduce, corruption. Because the, the meeting of the challenge of the sort that the coronavirus presents to society demands people's trust in the institutions they have. And if they believe that those institutions are corrupt, then the country is lamed in its ability to meet the challenge. Trust and elimination of corruption are very important weapons in meeting such challenges. My question is, do you think that this crisis will encourage companies and governments to invest more in innovation in science or not? I suppose there might be some small effect of that sort on companies, but I doubt very much that there'll be a large effect on companies. Companies exist to make money and they, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Thank yeah. goodness they exist. Uh, it's the responsibility of governments to do things that do not make money. And it's the responsibility of governments to increase their alertness, to have bodies that look for these things and perhaps have knowledge, yes, definitely have knowledge of what companies they can turn to when they see a problem coming and perhaps make early orders, uh, that's a governmental responsibility. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It has been fabulous and a pleasure to talk to you and get your insight on this whole range of very broad uh, questions that, as you rightfully noted, sometimes beyond uh, the field of your expertise and what you have been working on your entire life. So thanks once again. Professor Lauren Graham, Professor of History of Science with Harvard and MIT, uh, today was the guest of Insights of Kiev International Economic Forum. Professor, once again, thank you very much. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I hope to see you in person and hopefully actually at another edition of Kiev International Economic Forum. Thank you and Privet Ukraine. Thank you, sir. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.